I'm Marco Lorenzi, I'm a researcher at the area uh, Sofia Antipolis, um, so which is one of the area centers here in France, and I'm a member of the Epion Research Group, which is an area team in which we uh, do research on uh, biomedical imaging application and the development of modeling approaches for the analysis of uh, uh, healthcare data more in general. And today I'm going to explain you and uh, to, to, to share with you what uh, we are doing here as an activity, research activity, in particular, uh, the Fed Biomed project, which is a, a project for federated learning. And I will illustrate in this uh, presentation what actually federated learning is, what are the principles, why we, it's so interesting as a technology these days, and how we are trying to deploy uh, this technology uh, to real world uh, application, especially with the uh, uh, hospitals uh, located here in France. So, for doing data science or artificial intelligence, we need data. And uh, that's the essential requirement. And uh, to build, uh, especially, powerful uh, artificial intelligence uh, model and machine learning approaches, uh, we need uh, uh, very large data repositories. And uh, so this means that many times the data which is uh, available in a single hospital might not be enough actually to guarantee the development and the training of a very powerful uh, model. And we need much more. So that's why in the past years, uh, there have been more and more um, uh, efforts in uh, centralizing on creating large uh, uh, repositories uh, of health data. Ideally by uh, combining, merging together data set that comes from uh, different hospital in the region or national level or around the world. But this is actually not straightforward. Um, as you can imagine, there are uh, strong regulations, and you might have heard of the GDPR, RGPD in French, which is the European actually framework, legal framework for, uh, for governing uh, uh, the sharing uh, of uh, sensitive data, personal data uh, in uh, for tech application. And also here in France, uh, you might have heard about the Health Data Hub, which is the national uh, initiative actually for building this data lake, so the centralized repository where healthcare data should be hosted uh, from uh, all across uh, uh, the country and uh, ideally used for research purposes, for, uh, um, for analysis and so on. And you might have heard actually about the debate uh, that has been actually the public and reporting here, uh, for example, uh, a tribune uh, that was uh, uh, published last year in Le Monde. Because it's not been straightforward actually to implement this Health Data Hub, it's an initiative which is ongoing uh, and uh, there are technical and legal actually uh, issues that make uh, the, 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 the sharing of this data still complicated. And why so? Because, uh, uh, well, for example, in Europe, we have the, the GDPR. The GDPR regulates actually what we can do with personal data, uh, uh, how we can share it, and uh, um, what can be done and which kind of guarantee we have to uh, provide on, on uh, health data, for example, which is a very specific case of sensitive data. So GDPR is a, a European Union wrote the GDPR inspired by ethical principle and legal principle that comes from uh, yes the, the values that uh, uh, the different uh, countries uh, uh, to you wants to uh, push forward uh, in the society. And ideally, data should be the use of data of personal data. So in our case of healthcare data, should be limited. Uh, limited to what is uh, extremely necessary for the for the purpose of the application we want to do. So we cannot share more than what uh, we should. And uh, we need to ensure that we are taking all the possible preventive measures uh, to prevent a leakage of uh, sensitive information, to harm actually the, the person, the people which are behind actually the data. And this uh, impacts very much what we can do. For example, it's a uh, it's, it's common like practice to, for example, pseudonymize, anonymize the, the data before sending it and sharing it with, uh, with colleagues uh, or research partners. 
which means removing the name of the, of the subject of the patient and replacing it with some code. But it's, it's quite well known that uh, even pseudonymization can uh, entail some risk because uh, uh, even pseudonymized data can uh, still encode some specific traits of, uh, of, of a person through the features that we are sharing. And if we, we are able actually to cross the data with other kind of data still of the same individual, so to perform some queries, we can actually, uh, like in the game of guess, uh, guessing the person, we can actually identify or having quite high chances of identifying some person even while not knowing their name. So even sharing uh, pseudonymized data is a challenge and can pose actually some, some, some challenges from the legal and uh, perspective. And uh, this is a quite concrete case. For example, the scandal of Cambridge Analytica that you might have heard of uh, in, the, in the past, uh, what, what happened in the UK in the past years, was actually uh, leveraging these weaknesses and crossing uh, pseudonymous data from Facebook uh, and so from, from um, uh, voting uh, registries to uh, Facebook data in order to profile actual people. So this is a concrete case. And so this means that uh, the typical paradigm that we have been used in data science uh, for, for long and is, uh, what uh, is, uh, is the, 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 the main actually approach, which is collecting data somehow from devices, from hospital, from scanners, and then sending it to a researcher for doing analysis. Uh, this actually is uh, many times cannot be applied and uh, we cannot simply uh, use uh, this procedure for, uh, for sharing the data. And that's where actually federated learning as a discipline is uh, gaining more and more momentum. And uh, the principle is, is quite simple. The idea is that uh, uh, we don't uh, ask uh, the data uh, producers, which could be user with a smartphone or a hospital, we don't ask them to um, share, send us the data, share the data, but we ask them to perform some analysis locally, for example, uh, train an artificial intelligence, some model, and then sending us actually the model or the model parameters. And then we collect actually the model parameters from every hospital. And then we have some statistical, mathematical method to merge them to build a consensus, like a global model, which ideally should be the same model we could have obtained if we could access all the data um, as in the standard uh, uh, way of doing it. And so by sharing the model, the providers, uh, the clients are sharing some sort of uh, information about the data, but which is surrogated because uh, uh, it comes under the form of a model, sorry. And so there is a limited, ideally limited risk uh, for sharing uh, something which is harmful for the patient, so something which is sensitive to specific patients. And how this applies, for example, a simple case, let's assume that we want to perform a linear regression with some data points. So we want to find the, the, the regression line that fits this data. But let's assume that the data is, uh, comes from different centers. For example, the red one is center one, the green center two, and then other data points. So ideally what we will do, we will ask to each hospital to perform his own linear regression model. And then we can collect actually just the uh, regression line, so the, 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 the slopes. And, uh, and then we can, for example, average them or find a way to find a consensus between the slope to identify the ideal regression between all the data. And the point is that uh, here, the researcher never sees the data, but just sees the model, so the lines. So ideally, the, the individual points are protected. So this is the paradigm of federative learning. And this is actually uh, has been uh, becoming more and more popular in the past, uh, past years, because you can uh, see that uh, it solves uh, uh, some of the critical problems we have uh, when we deal with sensitive data. So more and more publication, I'm showing here a query from PubMed about publication using the uh, term federative learning in their title. So it's an exponential increase. And uh, the typical paradigm is that we have uh, a hospital that uh, sends some uh, model uh, to a, so a centralized server that sends some model parameter to each hospital. Each hospital will perform some training 
uh, to actually estimate the parameter locally, and they will be sent back to the server, and the server will aggregate them to identify this global model. Uh, and depending on the framework we are using, we might iterate this. So the global model might be sent back to the hospital, which train again uh, and back and forth many times, a number of times to converge toward a shared solution between all the participants. So this is in principle, this is what is uh, research. Um, and then uh, when we talk about this in practice, uh, there are many actually uh, aspects that have to be taken care of to, to, to realize in, in the real life uh, a system like the one of the federative learning. So there are many issues we have to take into account. And this is actually what we are confronted as a researcher, but also when we want to deploy this kind of system in real life. So we might uh, think that uh, when we deal with the hospital data and we cannot see the data which is in the hospital, well, we might be dealing with, uh, for example, heterogeneity uh, of the data. Some, for example, patients might not be represented in a hospital or represented differently. They might have different uh, kind of data which is collected at every site. So there is this kind of problem of merging model that perhaps they have not seen the same Thing, the same kind of data. And so they might be very heterogeneous. So it may be more difficult actually to find a consensus between this model. And in practice, data formats between hospitals might be very different. And so we have also a problem of how to put together things which uh, do not match because we don't have the same kind of image. We cannot, don't have the same fields in the, in the tables and so on. Uh, we are still transmitting models and models, we will see later, are not a total guarantee of not actually uh, revealing any information. Because still by looking at the model, we might still disclose something about the underlying data that has been used to train. So we need to ensure that what is flowing, so what is passing from researcher uh, to the cells, so to, to hospital, is secure. So there is an aspect of communication, security communication. Uh, there is an aspect of governance, which is very important to, to, to discuss, uh, actually, when we want to implement such a system. So where is the server? Who owns, actually, the, the server? What the researcher can do, which kind of request it can ask to the hospital? Can, should the hospital just be passively uh, training any kind of model, or there should be limitations? So which kind of control do we want? And uh, all the uh, regulation that you can imagine about data protection uh, um, and uh, ethical committees that have to be uh, uh, need to require to, to provide their approval when we perform such a, uh, an experiment because we are still dealing with sensitive information. And most importantly, at this point, uh, we need actually a hospital to play an active role. So it means that uh, in the hospital, we need to have uh, technical uh, personnel that takes care of the implementation, deployment of the platform. There is some training that has to be done in the model. So the hospital plays a role which becomes more and more active. So these are all problems uh, that uh, we need to deal with. And now in the rest of the talk, I will present you uh, yeah, some current initiative that we are doing to tackle all of this problem, to implement this kind of system in real life. So first to say that uh, federative learning uh, as a technical issue uh, is being uh, currently object of uh, active world uh, development. So there are many, many initiatives. I am citing here a few of them. Uh, so these are software communities that are developing frameworks for performing this uh, uh, training uh, with federative learning. There are also big companies which are involved uh, with their own project uh, like Intel, IBM, NVIDIA, and so on. So we have this jungle of frameworks. There is not really a standard. And each framework is different in the sense that they apply to certain machine learning model. Uh, they apply only uh, you know, to certain architecture, or they comply or not with certain requirements about security, communication, and so on. And so all of this uh, makes uh, 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 the landscape very heterogeneous so very difficult to make a choice. And uh, that's where actually Fed Biomed, so our project, is a uh, position uh, in the sense that we um, are developing this institutional initiative, 
There's something to support actually by area, by national agencies uh, and, and grants. Uh, to build a, a platform uh, inspired by the need of the hospitals so or the community for performing this federated learning. Uh, we enjoy also support from uh, companies, for example, Accenture Lab, that are uh, supporting with the uh, engineering personnel and the development and so on. And so the, 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 the rules that uh, say that they, they, that they motivate our work are about simplicity uh, and uh, compatibility with the the infrastructure, so the existing uh, network and constraints of the hospitals, and empowering actually the, the hospital with the security and, and governance. So this is how such a framework might uh, so uh, work. We see that we have uh, some uh, different hospitals that they have their data, and then uh, the data are shared through a, a secured uh, network. Um, so the data under the form, not the data, but the model trained on the data are pushed actually to uh, some sort of messaging uh, server that will uh, then uh, be queried by a researcher on the other side that can actually uh, perform and send messages to the hospital to retrieve the, the model or ask them to train the model on their side. And uh, so there are very different needs when we want to develop such a platform on both sides. Uh, on one side, uh, since we are dealing still with the research project when we train a uh, model, when we want to apply AI, so we want to have environments which are flexible, uh, possibility of training, uh, uh, testing actually different kinds of models uh, and having feedback in real time of what is happening, uh, if the training is going well, if we have to restart because things are going well. On the other side, we need the control uh, on what is going on. Uh, the hospital need to uh, uh, have the last word about what is happening uh, on their side. And they need to be able to overwrite, actually, to have the, indeed, so to establish uh, under which condition uh, the model are trained. And so there is also the aspect of privacy control, the, how much of information they are disclosing through a model uh, with this kind of uh, experiment. And so this is a, a bit technical, but uh, basically we have, uh, so we want to support a, a model that uh, uh, can be used uh, with different frameworks. So it can be, for example, uh, different uh, libraries for machine learning, not just a specific one. So we uh, spend a lot of time in defining general uh, infrastructure, general architecture, software architecture that can allow to wrap basically any sort of model in parallel and any sort of data as well. And then we define this sort of pipeline where we put together all the components. So which kind of processing we need to do on the data, uh, how much privacy do we need on the training, which kind of model, and how to put things together, what is the mathematical rule to find the, the global model. And we define what is a, as an experiment, uh, a federative learning strategy. And this is sent actually on the other side, and the hospital will uh, perform all this kind of instruction on their side. And uh, so there is a, the first need from the hospital is that the need of uh, uh, establishing the rules uh, of the game. So for example, uh, a, being able to uh, decide how many uh, rounds do we train, if we, which kind of resource we want to use locally, if CPU, GPU, uh, how many data do, we, they, do they want to disclose if it's not um, like too many or too few? And then enforcing uh, privacy uh, in terms of uh, what methods that we'll see later. later. And um, on the other side, we have the heterogeneity of the data. So you have to imagine, as you, as you might know probably better than me, that, uh, well, uh, Experiments that can be performed on a variety of data that they come with their own format. And, uh, and there is a strong heterogeneity between hospital among these formats. So we need a way actually to filter and create a consensus of the formats. So we need to, to provide the hospital with the tools uh, to um, uh, standardize according to some established uh, consensus uh, on how we want the data to look like. 
Um, and also on the other side, once this is done, a researcher should be able to query the network and ask which kind of data each uh, uh, hospital is uh, uh, providing to the federated learning. So for example, some information, metadata, uh, to identify which hospital can be used to train a given model. And then there is the big aspect of uh, security. Uh, so federated learning is not a guarantee of privacy of the data because there are many things that can go wrong in a federated learning experiment. And there are many examples in research uh, that show actually that uh, ill-intentioned uh, participant actually can damage, it can harm uh, the, the federated learning infrastructure. For example, a client might actually uh, sabotage uh, the experiment, for example, by injecting some data, which uh, uh, will make the, the entire training procedure diverge. Or uh, it might inject uh, some uh, additional task in the data so that the model uh, will not actually, uh, will also perform other kind of uh, uh, tasks beyond the one that was uh, uh, originally planned. And this could be also some manipulant task to reveal some information about the other client. Uh, we can have, for example, uh, if someone is able to intercept one of the local models, what uh, we can do, we can uh, actually, it has been shown that by uh, having access to this kind of information, it might be possible to uh, back uh, optimize the model to infer like some uh, relevant features from the data itself that has been used to train the model. And, uh, and so we can actually, by having access to a model, uh, somehow uh, reconstruct the data that has been uh, um, used to train the model. So this is called gradient leakage. So the server itself, uh, it can be compromised. So if the server has access to all this information from all the model, again, we expose the client to some uh, potential uh, loss of privacy. And, um, and so, Given all of this, uh, this uh, scenario, uh, it is clear that we need some additional reassurance or some additional protection of this kind of federated learning uh, uh, infrastructure. And um, so the first one is uh, preventing people, uh, external people, to uh, access uh, to the communication of federated learning, for example, by protecting a, a network, uh, encapsulating it in a VPN. Another um, aspect is uh, uh, asking the hospital um, to execute only code with the, which is trusted. Uh, for example, uh, they need to review and approve if a model should be um, used for, uh, for their experiment or not. Like in the same way, when we download an app, we need to approve actually uh, that app to be uh, running in our phone. That means that the hospital need to be empowered and need to be also will have some responsibility in executing uh, some code locally and need to know actually what the code is doing, which is uh, again uh, some different kind of role played by the data provider of the hospital in this sense. And then there is the aspect of privacy in the machine learning sense, and there are new tools that are, have been introduced to uh, actually allow federated uh, like. To, to disclose or to give guarantee that our training is uh, uh, somehow secure. One tool is differential privacy. Differential privacy is a principle is simple. For example, if we have to disclose some statistics that can be sensitive, uh, for example, an histogram about some feature of a population that might be sensitive, we don't want actually to uh, let, for example, people to, uh, by looking at the Instagram, identify if some person is present in this, uh, uh, in this uh, statistics or not, we might corrupt actually this uh, histogram. So not giving it the exact data, but perturbing it with some noise, for example, Gaussian noise or Laplace noise. So giving some sort of corrupted version of the histogram so that we will never have the certainty 
that a certain person contributed to create this histogram because uh, we have the noise that protects the person. This is called differential privacy and is a statistical concept which is becoming very, very popular in, uh, and, uh, in, in, uh, in machine learning, but especially in federative learning. So the idea is that uh, the hospital will not send them their model, but they will perturb it with some noise, which is uh, specifically tuned, so that uh, um, the server will not receive actually a model which is correspond exactly to the model trained on, uh, on the data. Uh, which are local, but it will be some sort of uncertain. There will be some uncertainty in it. So it will be more difficult to retrieve the data that has been used to train the model. Another concept is the one of uh, homomorphic encryption, in which uh, basically, since uh, at the end of the server, what it has to do is has to take several models and adding them together or averaging them. So there is a, some simple operation that is done, which is a sum, for example, you need to add things together. So the idea is that homomorphic encryption is a way to share quantities which are encrypted, but then we can still add them together. And then we can, and what we, the result will be still encrypted, but then we can, if we have the key, decrypt it and obtain the result of the operation. So for example, the sum. For example, let's assume that uh, uh, we have two person that have some number, three and five, and this number should be secret, and they need to add them together. So they need, they would like to obtain this operation eight, so the result, but without ever disclosing to each other three and five. Let's assume that these three and five are sensitive values, for example, I don't know, uh, some test, uh, blood test. So what they could do, they could encrypt this two number with some key, which is secret, that they only know, for example, Let's assume multiplying. It's a very toy example. This is not what happens in practice. But what they can share to each other is our numbers that are not the original one. But they have some mathematical structure behind so that if they sum this, so this number, they can decrypt it to obtain actually the final result. So at the end, what they will do, they will share is something that is not the original data, but the way actually the things are encrypted is that they can perform a mathematical operation to obtain the final result. Another way of doing this is through multi-party computation in which, uh, uh, for example, again, we want to add a three and five. What we can do, we can generate two random numbers. For example, the party one will generate a number 10, the party two will generate a number one. And so they can uh, uh, find actually the complement to obtain the original number. So in this case, party one will have 10 and minus seven, and party two will have one and four. And so they can share these two numbers separately to different entities, so that if the two entities know only these two numbers, they cannot retrieve the original number that was used to generate them. Because these two, they cannot communicate. We should make it in a way that they give guarantee that they can communicate. The only thing they can do, they can add these things together. So they will get 11 minus three, and then they can share the results to get the final operation. So without ever disclosing these numbers, but just by splitting them and sharing something which is random, we can obtain the final results. So this is what is done actually, again, in, uh, in uh, federative learning. Every model will be protected in this way. So the parameter will be encrypted and sent to the server that will aggregate them without knowing actually the original model and will obtain them. So, so this is actually something which is uh, ongoing research uh, and also is something which is uh, present in, uh, in, the, in, in, in this uh, uh, framework that uh, are being deployed uh, these days in modern way of doing uh, federative learning. There are issues because things do not work always as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as um, we would like because corrupting things makes things less precise so the models are not as good in general as we would like. And then we add complexity overall in the communication, encryption, so it becomes more complicated and slower. And, uh, and um, yeah, there are other applications we are developing, for example, of uh, performing the same uh, kind of approach, for example, for registering to medical images, 
if we have this image, we would like to transform it to match anatomically this other image, because maybe we want to compare, for example, here tumors uh, uh, at the same anatomical uh, level. We developed the same framework to being able to transform this image to match this one, so to become like this, without ever sharing the images. So, but by using always this principle of transfer, transferring only encrypted information. And uh, overall, uh, when we satisfy all these requirements, there are uh, ethical and legal uh, questions that still add uh, to the federated learning. And I write here some that comes from our discussion with clinician and uh, with data protection officers and so on. So in Shara, we control the federated learning execution. Uh, who is responsible at the end when we deploy such a network uh, because there are so many parties? who owns the network at the end, who, uh, uh, and, and, and the results. So this is a collaborative effort. So any model, the exploitation of intellectual properties uh, has to be defined. Uh, how we award the, the, the hospital that provide the most interesting data. And uh, what do we do if a hospital decides to quit actually federated learning? What do we do with the, with the model that was used with the data of this hospital? Uh, should we throw everything away or we uh, can still use it? So these are all open questions. And there is also research in ongoing that uh, has been done for, is, is currently done to answer this question. And uh, maybe I'm skipping this one. So this is actually all of the issues and the challenges we try to face with this project. And uh, which is fed by Ahmed. I invite you actually to visit our page if you want to know more about it. And the current application is uh, uh, in a network of uh, a hospital in France, which is a, a hospital that uh, um, are part of the UniCancer consortium, in which uh, the, the goal is to establish this federative infrastructure to train jointly a model, uh, so is a, in this case, a neural network that can analyze PET CT data plus clinical data to identify uh, the response to immunotherapy. Uh, in an automatic way. So what you can see here, for example, is uh, the ongoing uh, 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 so training that we have been doing with the, with the model. So you can see, for example, three hospitals, which are actually the, the first pilot institute that already have the uh, infrastructure fed by Omed running. So you can see this is the training of uh, their neural network. This is the loss curve of their local models that is going down. They are all going down. So it means that they are jointly learning actually this uh, recognition model uh, based on the techniques. We had also other deployment uh, for other tasks with other partners. So this is actually something which is currently used what we are doing in real life, which is very rewarding. So it's, it's a project started a couple of years uh, ago. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, everything. I hope that um, uh, with my talk, I could give you an overview actually of all the challenges and uh, what the principle of disability learning and I would like to thank actually all the people that collaborated uh, and that are behind uh, all uh, what I showed you before. You see as a collaborative project for collaborative learning. So there are many, many people involved in the institute. And um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks all for your attention.